I've got to talk to you about acute breathless and wheezing in children. So it's mainly about acute wheezing, but there's a bit about breath, thinking about breathlessness as well. You can all hear me okay? Excellent, good. So what I'm going to do is just think briefly about the background and then thinking about recognising acute breathlessness and wheezing, a bit about thinking about severity, the simple urgent treatments, uh, referral uh, or not referral if you like, uh, discharge and then planning for the future. So that's basically what I'm going to cover. So I suppose the term that we're usually thinking about is acute attacks. That's the term that we've used in the BTS uh, sign guideline. Uh, there was a very, uh, I thought, persuasive article in Thorax 2 saying that people should think about, uh, rather than calling these, uh, calling episodes of wheezing particularly, exacerbations or as the Americans do, is flare, actually it's an attack. And uh, that, the advice from the patients was that that was a helpful way to think about it. And that would be de defined as an acute or a subacute worsening in symptoms and lung function from the patient's usual, usual status. And that's the term that we, we've used in the, the, the uh, BTS sign guideline. It was interesting because I was talking to our paediatric respiratory nurse yesterday and she was just saying that one of the things that she's got to just touch base with families is about the understanding of the term attack. For an attack in this context, you're really talking about something that's usually coming on over 12 to 24 to 48 hours. So it's not like basically I'm going to fall down and have an epileptic uh, fit uh, now. It's something that's uh, built up. So I think there's a, there's a sense that you have to check that the under, your understanding of what people mean by uh, an attack is actually the, the same as what you're thinking of. And I would just remind you that wheezing, wheezing attacks particularly uh, are common in children. So from the ALSPAC study, which was a big cohort study in Avon, where they followed children over, they've now followed them uh, right throughout childhood. By 18 months, 26% of the children in a UK birth cohort study would have at least one episode of wheezing. So wheezing is very common. Uh, it's perhaps more interesting if I put this in the context of what we got, the data that we got from the BTS Paediatric Asthma Audit, which is an audit we've done over a number of years in November. It's a national audit. The last time we did it was in 2016 and there were 5,000 children that were admitted to hospital uh, in November and where they put uh, data into the audit. And within that audit there's a question, is there a history of previous wheezing? Uh, I should say that three quarters of the children that come in at, it, it, during that month of November are under five. So we're usually dealing with uh, young children. And the answer to the question could be no, or yes, wheezing only with colds, yes, wheezing between t colds, or uh, if you didn't have any information then uh, you would put it down like that. And if I just show you the data first of all. so. Here's children who are admitted to hospital with an acute wheezing episode and when they're asked if, have they had any previous wheezing, the answer is no. So throughout childhood, but particularly in children under five, you could be dealing with someone with their first ever episode of wheezing. And notice that that continues really right throughout childhood, longer I think than you might expect if you were worried about something like viral induced wheezing. You wouldn't expect children of 10 or 11 or, or 12 to be presenting with what's effectively their first ever wheezing episode, but that was the data that we got. So there's a group of children where it's the first time they've ever had wheezing, there isn't a history of it before. Then there's a children a history uh, which you'll see peaks around three years of age when the children have a history of wheezing with colds in the past. And you can see again that that extends throughout childhood, but it's becoming less common as you get older. So here's children who are having attacks, but uh, they're not having any symptoms in between times. And here's the children who've, who we've got what I would call interval symptoms. So as you're getting older, these children are having attacks and they're having problems in between times. So they're getting problems with uh, wheezing and exercise, wheezing at night. So I think you have to get that, in, that, that into your head. If you think of the common pattern of asthma as supposedly chronic symptoms of cough, wheezing, breathlessness, 
actually most children that you're dealing with, until you get older, are not really presenting like that. What they're presenting with is attacks of wheezing. So attacks that are coming on, and these attacks are, uh, we know are going to be usually triggered by viral respiratory infections. For some children, actually, this will be the first time they've ever had it before. For other children, there will be a history of it, of it in the past. So we'll come back to think about that, how that influences, I think, what you're doing when you're thinking of the, the history. But clearly, if you're a paediatrician, attacks of wheezing, uh, attacks of breathlessness are the thing that you need to be thinking about. So that I want to just think a little bit about recognising acute breathlessness and uh, wheezing. So this, uh, Sheila McKenzie and Rachel Kane, I think, did some, these are, they, there's two papers they've done which are extremely important. And what they were really trying to do was sort out respiratory noises and wheezing and what parents understand by wheezing. Now, I'm sure a lot of you will be aware that actually um, what parents wheeze is a generic term for a respiratory noise for some people, and it could mean anything. It doesn't necessarily mean what I mean by wheezing. It could be something completely different. So here they started off by saying, what do parents understand by wheezing? And they've got, what is your idea of wheeze? How do you know your child is wheezy? Uh, what is the main thing you notice? Now, you might say, well, actually, wheezing is a noise. So the thing I would expect the parents to say is, I would recognize my child was wheezing because I recognize the noise. And if you read across the top line, you'll actually, only a third of people rely on the sound alone. What's much more common is that they rely on difficulty breathing or a combination of things with uh, difficulty breathing. So the parents are looking, if you like, at the whole child. And they make their assessment of that based on their assessment of the whole child. What they're not relying on is just the idea of the child being wheezing and producing a noise. So I think that's an important thing to just remember. Now, here's what they went on to do is they, 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 in their East London Accident and Emergency Department, they videoed children who were com coming in. They get lots of videos of children presenting with acute uh, wheeze slash breathlessness, and they put them into uh, what they thought were sort of classic boxes. And then they showed the information to the parents to see what, how they got on actually recognizing it. So I'm going to present you two children here who've got, if I can get it to work, uh, who've got acute breathlessness. Let's see if I'm So, how would you know that child it was breathless? Sorry? Okay, where can you see the effort in the breathing? You can see recession subcostally. I'll play it again for you. What else can you see? Okay. He's using his cheeks, okay. Anything else? So we've got, an, we've got a noise, an expiratory noise. I think most of us would say squeezing. What else did they have? What kind of cough? Tight, tight's a very good description, I think. I think the word I would usually use is dry. So but notice distinguishing dry and wet coughs become quite important in pediatrics. Uh, 
So, so you can see a range of things there. And if I actually turn the sound off, uh, I think you would also uh, be able to tell the child uh, was wheezing. I think one thing I find very helpful is to look at the pattern of breathing there. So what is the ratio between inspiration and expiration? Prolonged expiratory uh, phase. And I think, you know, basically any child, if you put them in bed, if they're in bed or their mother's knee, if you take their top off and watch their breathing, you can tell whether they've got an obstructive uh, a condition or not and that's really helpful so that's one thing I would pick up if we just look at that again just to see what I, I think remember this is a child in casualty so the thing I think is a bit striking is you wouldn't immediately say well actually this child looks extremely uh, acutely distressed if you like so it just makes the the, the, the point that uh, there's a range of things you have to put to, to, together uh, to sorry or right, I'll play this one then So what would you say about this child? She's breathing fast, yep. Sorry? So mouth's open, okay. I don't think, it's probably, it's, it's probably much closer to normal. I think if you looked at it, you may say it's marginally prolonged, but it's strikingly different from the other child, I think. For, for me listening to it, they, they don't have that prolonged thing. So I'm saying to myself, I don't think this is an obstructive condition. And what else would you notice? It's the colour's not perfect. You might uh, uh, be worried about that. The child looks lethargic. It's got that sort of periolar, periodal colour. So if I said to you, which child would you be worried about most? I'd be more worried about the second. I'd be worried this was an acute pneumonia. And actually, this child looks, I would have said, looks a bit sick. But you notice, actually, how to said, these things are relatively s subtle. You know, if, if you're used to looking at them, you'd have said, right, okay, this is particularly obvious. But remember, these are children in casualty that are presenting. Uh, they're not immediately coming over as... Uh, you know, you have to look and think about what you're seeing. I find the prolonged expiration in the first child very helpful uh, in just working out it's an obstructive condition, the general demeanour of the second child. Uh, so I think when, you, when the child presents to you and you're getting the history and looking at the child, you have to look very critically uh, as to what you're going on, what you're looking at. And there's a whole series of videos that I, I won't go through. What they discovered was with wheezing, at least 30% with or without wheezy children, so whether you're wheezy children in the family or not, use words for other words uh, for wheezing. And approximately 30% falsely labelled other sounds as wheezing. So, for example, that might be some people calling what you would uh, accept as croup or strider and calling that a wheezing noise. Uh, and then other people describing wheezing as something uh, different than what you would recognise as wheezing. So, labelling. Uh, the communication between you as a parent and me as a doctor is problematic in terms of the words we use. So you really want to uh, get the best information you can. Now clearly in an acute situation you're, you've got the child before you and you hopefully can agree about it. In the chronic situation then I think getting the parents to actually video the children now is fantastically useful get your phone out, get, get them to record a bit of the breathing, particularly if you can see the chest, uh, and the, the, that's something you can potentially discuss with them in the future. Uh, parents were better at labelling wheezy than other sounds, so strider, uh, and occasionally I do see children that are coming along who've really got episodes of strider, say for recurrent croup, uh, and it's been called wheezing. They were better at labelling wheezing than the other noises. 
they're better at locating sounds. So where the sound comes from uh, was important. So does the sound come from the neck or is the sound coming from the chest? That's, those are helpful things to uh, sort out. Uh, it didn't matter whether you were used to dealing with uh, wheezing uh, children or not, uh, and it was better at labeling English as a first language. Apparently, a number of other languages don't have very good words for describing wheezing, so that effectively the concept isn't really embedded in the language, and therefore it's problematic. So in a multicultural setting, uh, be careful. So when you see a child, uh, acutely or otherwise, I think you really have to be careful about trying to understand exactly what the the physiological problem that you're dealing with is. Uh, for wheezing, the main differential diagnosis will be bronchiolitis. Remember, bronchiolitis tends to occur at a particular time of year, so we get epidemics of it. It's usually around for us in November, December that we get these big peaks of it. The children, uh, most children under two years of age will have had bronchiolitis. It's most commonly in the first year and it peaks around six months of e uh, age. You've got a typical picture of a child who comes along with a, who's at a runny nose, it's lasted one to two, three, two uh, days, they get a persistent uh, dry cough, they're breathless, they may have evidence of recession, they may have some wheezing when you listen, more particularly they often have crackles in the chest when you actually auscultate, uh, and they usually come to hospital when they're unable to uh, feed. And that's the time you, uh, you start to see them coming to hospital. Now, it's quite interesting because there's a lot of work trying to understand, if you like, the, the pathophysiology of these conditions. And one of the striking things about, I, I always think about bronchiolitis as a viral condition, is that it results in neutrophils in the airways. So it's a neutrophilic condition. That's a bit more like a sort of what you would expect in a person with chronic bronchitis. The other condition that we think about is wheezing sort of uh, asthma, what's often viol called viral induced wheezing. We know that about 60% of these, 60 to 70% of these episodes in childhood will be triggered by viruses, the most common of which is rhinovirus. Uh, other viruses can also uh, do the thing. The children we would expect to be slightly older. Uh, there may be a history, as I've shown you, of having had similar attacks in the past. Uh, you may have, in, on rare occasions, they may have what we call interval symptoms, that is they may have some wheezing as well, uh, and many of these children will also have a history, uh, either a family history or a personal history of some other atopic condition, so they'll have an allergic background uh, with them as well. And they, as I say, they tend to be a bit older. Now, it's quite interesting here. I think people often talk about viral induced wheezing, and many, many, many of my colleagues, for example, would see that as being something different from uh, asthma, if you like, or allergic asthma. And this is a sort of, so people are trying to understand, if you like, the actual immunopathology of, of uh, the, 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 the different conditions. And I think one of the things that comes out is in the children who have wheezing, uh, an eosinophilic inflammation is important. So if you've got a background of an atopic condition, you're allergic, it's eosinophils that seem to be the thing. And targeting eosinophils by, say, inhaled corticosteroids is important. And what the, the, this is a sort of model, it may not be the correct model, but it helps me a little bit understand. This was a, it's based on a scientific uh, paper in Thorax, which I thought was really helpful, and this was the model they had. So. The rhinovirus comes along. As I say, most of these things are triggered by rhinovirus. Rhinovirus is, uses first, or the, or the first line of defense against rhinovirus is called the innate immune system. So remember, we have um, a, a, an adaptive immune system. You're exposed to measles. You develop immun uh, immunity against measles, so that protects you in the future. You've also got a preformed immune system. Uh, which is there, uh, which is less specific, but is uh, able to help defend. So in rhino, what rhinovirus is done is bind to this particular receptor, the toll light receptor 7. Uh, that then uh, in, uh, promotes interferon, which are non-specific antiviral drugs. The antiviral drugs then turn off, uh, inter, inter, interrelate with the the allergic pathways. So IL-5 is the thing that stimulates eosinophils, so they would turn off the eosinophils, uh, and damp down the reaction. Now, it looks as though people that get uh, asthma attacks, particularly those that have got an atopic background, probably have a deficiency around here. So they've got a subtle hole. Whether it's a permanent hole, 
uh, or a developmental hole, that is it gets better as you get older, I don't think we fully understand yet. But the consequence is, when the rhinovirus binds, this isn't produced as much. And therefore this pathway, this allergic pathway, uh, isn't uh, damped down. And that means that the allergic pathway can then play down, uh, pl can actually play into that. It turns off the uh, innate immune system even more. And you're into a position where those people are at risk of getting a viral infection, playing into an allergic pathway, and then getting an allergic uh, response, which looks like uh, it's usually an eosinophilic response. And that's what, you would, that's what would be characteristic of uh, an a person with allergic asthma. And in people who've got atopy in the background, I think it's a bit like having a sort of heater here. So the more atopic you are, the more the whole thing is turned up at the beginning and the more these pathways are activated and then you get a viral infection coming along on top of it and you're not in a good place. So the asthmatic people, I think, are tending to get an eosinophilic pathway and the bronchiolytic people have got a completely different pa pathway because it's neutrophilic. And we don't really understand yet that that's where I think the cutting edge in research is in trying to understand what these viral infections are doing and whether one particular viral infection may need a particular uh, approach in terms of treatment and another one may need a, di a different approach in treatment. So that's the space to watch, I think. But it seems to me viral induced infections in this model effectively are playing into allergic asthma. So to say a viral induced, viral induced wheezing is like different from allergic asthma to me doesn't make sense. Actually, the whole thing is linked together. Now, there are some other causes of respiratory distress that we need to think about. Uh, pneumonia is less common, uh, but clearly in world terms, pneumonia is a big peril. So we've already looked at a picture of a child who I think is presenting with the clinical features of uh, pneumonia. Uh, croup, uh, croup you'll see in general practice in hospital. It's virtually been wiped out by the use of steroids because they recognized it was a steroid responsive disease. So when I started work, we used to have lots of people coming in with croup triggered by a viral infection attack. It's like a sort of laryngitis in a person with a very small airway. Uh, they get this noise and difficulty breathing, but it's steroid responsive. The steroids basically uh, open up the airways and you don't get problems with it. So it's managed largely in general practice now. And whooping cough. Whooping cough basically is a characteristic cough. Uh, we sometimes see it in people who have asthma and uh, therefore they get a cough on top of it. The parents recognize it's a different cough, but don't exactly know how to the, the treatments they use for it don't work, so being able to separate that off uh, is a problem. Anaphylaxis uh, is an issue. Uh, my sole experience of anaphylaxis was one lady in the clinic who brought her daughter up who had very troublesome asthma, and there was a waiting time, I'm afraid, in, in that particular day, and she'd had an egg sandwich. So she comes into the clinic, and it's the lady that's got the anaphylactic reaction, and she's sitting there coughing and trying to pretend. We had to stop the clinic, get the lady along, flatten the bed, EpiPen out, called the arrest team off to the uh, uh, thing. And I, th I thought it was really scary, actually. So if you, if you put that into a child, uh, it does happen. Uh, you do get children with acute anaphylaxis, so you do have to be conscious of it, and you do need to uh, be able to manage it appropriately. Inhaled foreign body, I think the key issue there is the child should previously have been well. They've not had any respiratory symptoms, and it's cough that should be the main problem. And these things at the bottom are, are really rare. So hopefully you just recognize someone's not doing well and get them to hospital rather than getting a specific diagnosis. So actually recognizing acute respiratory distress, I think, is an issue. It's more difficult than you might think. If I show all these videos to the medical students there, you know, getting them to talk their way through it, uh, they find it quite hard. What questions do we need to ask? Well, I think we need to get a sense of how the attack developed. So if it's like an inhaled foreign body, if it develops really quickly, that's an issue. Were there triggers to the attack? Usually, uh, we're often seeing attacks in, uh, of wheezing, certainly. In most cases, they're triggered by a viral infection. So we're looking for a viral prodrome. Have you had a runny nose? Have you uh, developed a bit of cough? Has it then progressed to something else? Have they had attacks before? Have they been admitted to hospital before? That's a key question. Have they been in ICU before? If you get answers yes and yes, then basically you're thinking this person needs to get to hospital quickly. 
and particularly for young uh, children, the attack can progress very quickly. I've got a nice case history of, of a mother in the morning who's, who'd, who had a child who'd had a, an attack before. There's a strong atopic family history. The child's 11 months of age. Uh, he's a, a bit unwell in the morning. She gives him some bronchodilator. Uh, but he goes off to nursery at 11.30, uh, the person looking after him thought he was a bit unwell, gave him some more bronchodilator and called his mother. By 2.30 in the afternoon, his mother thought he was really unwell and brought him to hospital. By 4.30, he's, he's, he's ventilated and uh, intubated with uh, acute respiratory failure. So the pace of attacks, I think you need to be uh, careful of, particularly in younger children. Uh, and if you've been in hospital before, that's important. Have you got a history of wheezing between the attacks, what we call interval symptoms? Have they had medications? Were the medications helpful? What are the social circumstances uh, you're dealing with? Now, assessing severity, you'll know that there are, there are, uh, there are schedules available that allow us to say mild, moderate, uh, uh, severe, and I'm not going to go through this. I just thought I would highlight to you some issues around assessing severity and just think about what you're what you're worried about. The first thing I think to say is that breathlessness is an, is an awareness of discomfort usually. So it's you that's breathless and that you would identify it. That's not really meaningless, uh, meaningful in a young child because they cannot communicate to you. You know, they don't put their hand up and say, hi, I'm feeling breathless today. You don't have the vocabulary to be able to do that. So you have to pick it up from observation like the parents do with the difficulty in breathing. Uh, and you're looking for evidence of the things that we picked up from the video. We might have fast breathing, we might have the use of the, the accessory muscles or the exaggerated abdominal discussion or uh, at a more mild level they might have had to stop exercise or you might see the prolonged uh, uh, expiration that I've highlighted to you that occurs in obstructive disease. Here's the things you can do. So are they tachypneic? Are they using their accessory muscle race, uh, use? What's the re relationship between inspiration and uh, expiration? Uh, can they, a good, a good assessment in older children might be, are they able to talk in sentences or talk in words or is their talking completely uh, uninterrupted? And what we're looking at here is the effort of breathing. And remember the issue in children is that when children get into cardio, acute cardiorespiratory difficulties, the, thing, the, the, the issue is they develop acute respiratory failure by large, they don't have cardiac problems. It's acute respiratory failure that they get. So that the, 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 um, the amount of work required in the effort of breathing overwhelms them. And the consequence of that is that you then see the outcomes of breathing. That is uh, what happens to your oxygen level in the blood. It falls, so you might become uh, desaturated, which is what you suggested for that first lady. But of course, all our experience is that actually we're not good at re uh, uh, recognizing cyanosis, and actually you will already have had a significant fall in your, oxy your arterial oxygen level by the time you are confident that the child is cyanosed. So uh, really, measuring oxygen saturation has been transformational in pediatrics, and really it's now uh, an additional vital sign because you cannot rely on on your, your, your color to indicate whether you're desaturated or not. And as I say, by the time you're, by the time you're cyanosed, effectively your oxygen saturation is a long way down. I always have to point out to the medical students that saturation is an extremely unusual scale. Uh, measuring your pulse ox oximetry level from zero to 100 is an extremely unusual thing in, in, in any form of medicine because most scales in medicine are uh, step scales, you know, it's Hooke's law. One unit of extension, one unit, or one unit of force, one unit of extension. One unit, of, uh, two units of force, two units of extension. Saturation is basically like Niagara Falls. You're going along, everything, everything's looking fine. Your saturation is holding up, but actually your arterial oxygen level is falling, and then suddenly you fall off the falls and you're in a really bad way very quickly. So a small change in your saturation at the top end of the range actually is a big change in your oxygen by something like 90% saturation. A 10% fall in your saturation, your arterial oxygen level is halved. That's like big time. So you can't afford to have a cup of tea and wait for it to go down. You have to respond. So measuring oxygen saturation has been transformational with followers. Clearly, if your breathing's not working, your saturation's going to go down. 
92 seems to be a good figure for uh, those people that presented with acute wheezing who had saturations of 92 or less were the people that were more severe and were more likely to finish up in hospital. You've got changes in your pulse rate. Uh, eventually your mental status is going to be affected and if you've got marked obstruction clearly your chest expansion might not be so effective because you're getting tired and your air entry might be poor. So that's really what we're trying to do. So your mild, moderate and severe categories, your saturation is very important and then you're trying to fit the child into these other categories. But what you're worried about is that the child's going to develop a respiratory failure. That is, the CO2 is going to rise and basically you're going to have to intervene and take over respiration. And you want to be able to try and intervene and reverse that before they get to that stage. So signs of deterioration, more recession, an increasing respiratory rate, a rising pulse rate, the child getting tired, uh, an alteration in their mental state and then becoming uh, hypoxic and then uh, you might see cyanosis as well. For wheezing, uh, what do you do? Well, the urgent treatments available to us are oxygen, inhaled short-acting uh, beta agonists in high doses and oral corticosteroids. Those are the three principal things we're working on. When do you give oxygen? Well, you don't need to give oxygen if the saturation is normal. So if you measure the saturation, you're really trying to get, uh, check that the saturation is normal. If it's not normal, what you're then planning to do is give oxygen to, to make it normal. And usually you don't have to use, people say high flow oxygen, but actually quite often relatively low flow, uh, flows of oxygen, uh, and we use nasal cannula a lot, will be sufficient to correct your oxygen level. But if you don't know, then clearly using a high flow would be appropriate. Inhaled short acting uh, beta agonists, uh, in most cases, you should be able to give that uh, using uh, a large volume spacer. So you're using multiple doses via a large volume spacer. Clearly, if you're, coming, if you're becoming unwell, then we would add in extra drugs, and then we often are using nebulized drugs. So now, for the people that are most unwell, we're using uh, high-dose bronchodilators nebulized, mixed with ipratropium nebulized, mixed with magnesium nebulized, what they call meganebs, which is uh, quite appropriate. And then the question of oral corticosteroids, uh, which for older children, I think, have been a key part of managing uh, wheezing illness. But for younger children, I, I'll just review where I think we are just now. Uh, urgent transfer if the child has low oxygen saturations or other features suggesting severe or life-threatening uh, asthma, and children with a poor response to initial treatments who are, who are, who are not uh, improving with them. And I've put in ambulance because sometimes parents will put the child in the car and bring it to hospital. The, the strong advice is do not do that. Uh, call the ambulance. The ambulance is able, is, they've got a nebulizer available, they've got drugs available, they can resuscitate you if you can. It is not helpful to be in a car in the motorway with your child having an acute cardiorespiratory arrest. That is not a good place to be. And there were a number of deaths in the uh, in one of the uh, East of England death survey where that had happened uh, to children. Uh, and I can, we can certainly think of a number of children where uh, the parents have, uh, and it's not clear, that these are episodes that sometimes have developed quickly and they may over in, interrelate with um, acute anaphylaxis type episodes, but I can think of one or two children where the parents have been driving the children to hospital and the children have been saying to their parents that they thought they were dying and they were correct, they did die. So uh, I think, in general, get the ambulance. What about oral steroids? There's been a number of big trials. Uh, in older in children over five, I think oral steroids uh, are clearly something you should include. In younger children, the evidence is a bit more circumspect at present. So uh, for mild attacks triggered by what you think is a virus, uh, you should in the main, I think, be able to manage it with uh, inhaled bronchodilators. Uh, for more severe attacks, uh, we still, without terribly good evidence, uh, think that steroids are an important part of the uh, <clears throat> treatment. So I think the exact positioning of steroids in younger children is a bit uncertain at present. Uh, and there's a suggestion that we might be using them more than we need to do, but I think if you're in a hospital setting, you're likely to be using them in a general practice setting, then you, I think, can make an assessment. They're not always required. If you've got some, a child like that, if they're improving and the attack is mild to moderate, you might be able to get them home after a period of observation. 
If they go home, uh, you need to make sure they've got information and medication and safety net advice. We'll go through what that involves. If they're not improving, uh, then they may need to go to hospital. And that means if they're not get if, they're, if their bronchodilator is not lasting four hours, so we usually increase the bronchodilator amount to 10 puffs, and you should get four hours relief from that. If, it, if you're eating into that, basically you're severely unwell and you should be going to hospital. I say to people, you might, we would give it more frequently in hospital, but I have the benefit of an intensive care unit down the road, uh, or you know, down the, down the corridor sort of thing. You don't have that in, in the community. So effectively what you want to do is do something that's safe, and then when it's getting towards the unsafe end, you want to opt out. Uh, watch out for children presenting late in the afternoon or at night. It's not wise to send them home because often asthma is worse at night, so you might be sending them home just at the time they're likely to be worse. Be very careful about children that have had a, uh, a, an, an admission before uh, and uh, think about social circumstances. Safety netting, the things you should be doing. Uh, you need to make sure they know how their inhalers uh, should be used, uh, when they should be thinking that the inhalers are not working uh, and what they can do while they're awaiting uh, medical care. And there's a whole series of things that you need to be able to check your way through, uh, I think, before you actually uh, send people home in that situation. Uh, what about the future? The, the guidelines are clear. There should be a sort of 48-hour uh, review with the general practitioner. And the general practitioners always support this. Now, I think that's often, it, it fails to happen. But actually, it, I think it's an important part of care that we should be trying to achieve. Uh, what you need to do at the 48-hour review is, first of all, review how they're getting on with the episode that uh, they are at the tail end of. Then you have to think about, they've had an episode. The likelihood is they may have another episode in the future. So they need an emergency planning to be thought about. They need to know how to spot the symptoms are getting worse, what to do when they're getting worse, what to do in an emergency. Sometimes we have to rehearse what you're going to say to the ambulance man if things are not going well. Uh, and when and how to call for an emergency help. And I think if you've had an acute attack of uh, wheezing particularly, that needs to be done for everybody because it could happen again in the future. Uh, if you've got uh, symptoms between the attacks, if you've got interval symptoms, then there's a variety of things that you might be able to do. So you might be able to avoid triggers. You might be thinking about using some form of uh, uh, relieving or preventing medication for these people. Uh, and uh, that might extend to using a regular preventer medication to try and uh, control symptoms and make attacks less frequent. So that's the sort of things you need to think about. I think of this as the first uh, recognizing, assessing severity, urgent treatment is the first four hours. That's a medical task, really. That's the bit that's medical. The next bit is thinking about coming to hospital or not uh, and planning for the immediate discharges. Can we get you through the night? Can we successfully quick hit you up to be able to get through to the following morning? And then we're thinking about can we plan out for what's going to happen in the future uh, so that there's a plan in place that you can use for the future and you've got treatments available that might be able to uh, manage that safely. So those are the key things I think you need to be thinking of. In general, often I think the medical bit of it, the assessment, the urgent treatments are relatively uh, simple. Thank you very much. Um, just a question about eosinophilia. I'd always thought that was uh, an effect of having asthma. It appeared to be the cause from your wee slide with the interferons and the interleukins and whatnot? Well, I think there's a link between... It. I think people often think of viral-induced asthma, as I say, as though it's something... or viral-induced wheezing. They put it in a box and you imagine it's something separate. I think what the evidence is starting to say is actually for viral-induced tweezing, actually there's an interrelation into these allergic pathways with the eosinophils. And actually for some of these people, the eosinophil looks like a very key slide. So there's a nice study from America recently that looks at preschool children and it looks at using, uh, and it separates the children on the basis of whether they're sensitized or not and whether they've got eosinophilia in the blood. So basically, have they got markers of atopy? In the children who've got the markers of atopy, they're more likely to get uh, a reduction in their future exacerbations. And remember, their future exacerbations are going to be mainly triggered by uh, viral infections by using inhaled corticosteroids. 
So if what we're trying to do is say, here's this mass of people, can we start to pick out those people that might get benefit from uh, the, the, the inhaled corticosteroids that we commonly use? And remember, I think you have to think, of, you have to be clear, and it's becoming clear in other situations. In asthma, there, there's an, one outcome is, are you having an attack? That's an outcome from asthma. Can we prevent attacks? There's another set of outcomes which relate to, are you having chronic symptoms? So are you getting wheezy running about? Are you being disturbed at night or sort of thing? And I always assumed that these were the, effectively the same manifestations. Actually, it looks as though attacks can be separated off and there may be treatments which deal with attacks which are not so good at, deal, good at dealing with symptoms and vice versa. So. Uh, I think the eosinophil is, is, is coming out as quite an important cell uh, and I think that's where the, more of the story is going to come out. But I think for me the idea that viral induced wheezing is just is something separate from asthma I think is maybe not, not, is not a good idea. Actually the approaches and the, the pathophysiological mechanisms I think relate to more like your understanding of allergic asthma than, than uh, something separate. Thank you for the, the talk. Um, so leading on from what you were just saying, with these children that uh, really only get wheezy when they have viral episodes and attacks, what, what is the role then for intercurrent preventer therapy? There may be none. Uh, but that's, uh, it, may be, it may be for most children that you don't uh, have none. So I have children, some children, I don't see it, huge amounts of these because clearly we're more at the severe end of the spectrum. But it may be that if you've got occasional one or two attacks a year, then what you're doing is managing the attack and you're not doing anything apart from that. But if the attacks become more severe or more frequent, or maybe if you're looking at an atopic background uh, and you've got sensitization and eosinophilia, then you think actually maybe I can get some effect from using an inhaled corticosteroid. So then you're using more regular medication. So you're going to have to make a judgment between the two. And that's not, a, I think that's a bit of a shifting field for us. But it's perfectly reasonable to say, actually you've only had uh, one attack but what you need to do then is plan for the next attack. So I think what you, what, you, what you shouldn't be doing is saying, you've had an attack, I'm not going to do anything. Actually, what you need to do is use that attack as a model and you need to work out what you're going to do. That might be bronchodilators. For some of the severe attacks, for us, it, it would be how to recognize all the stuff. Uh, it might be that we provide you with a course of steroids to use at home as well. So there's a whole package of things that we would give you on the basis that you'd have an attack. I might not give you any medicines to use in between times, but I've prepared you for the next attack. So th that bit, I think, the, preparing for the next attack is compulsory. What you do with the preventive medicines. So then you're looking for, are the attacks frequent, severe, troublesome, maybe other markers, or have you got interval symptoms that says this person has actually got, is shading towards what you would regard as more conventional asthma. So you're more comfortable not using uh, regular asthma yeah, medicines. So in terms of other markers, and there might be a role for full blood counts in these children? Oh, I think there's, there's, a, there's a, a lot of interest in a full blood count, yeah, uh, uh, with evidence of eosinophilia. But that's at the cutting edge. You know, would I send you away to say you must all do full blood counts on them? No, but actually uh, measuring whether you've got eosinophilia in your blood, I think, is looking like a better marker than we've maybe realised.